Yes, Grace, I really dodged a bullet there. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Well, again, I just wanted to, to, to thank the Lord for the way he speaks to us so much during the early part of the service, and I hope you are paying good heed and taking uh, mental notes. And the Lord spoke to us earlier in the service and, and said that um, even though we don't always desire the Lord and thirst for the Lord the way we want to, we can bring that to him and confess to him even our lack of desire for him and let him deal with that. And he also spoke to us earlier in the service and said that he, uh, in our experience of worship, he wants to teach us to love one another. And uh, we need to learn from the Lord how to do that. And the apostle says actually that we're taught by God to love one another. And uh, so, so many good, great things that the Lord is speaking to us already. And um, it's just a privilege and an honor to be a part of that. And um, you know, I, there are some preachers who will dazzle you with fantastic PowerPoints. Uh, I'm not one of those. Uh, I am um, Mr. Low Tech, as you know. If you don't believe me, ask Carl Dreer. But uh, in fact, I don't even know what a PowerPoint is. Um, I was thinking that the, 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 the PowerPoint that I think of is the tip of the spear of Goliath. Uh, that's the most powerful point I can think of. And uh, he had his, the staff of his, the, the, the uh, beam of his spear was like a, the, a weaver's beam, the shaft. And um, he was ready to get David with that, point, with that PowerPoint. Um, fortunately, David was pretty quick with the, shing, sling, with the slingshot. And uh, so he, did, he never got the point. But uh, you will get the point of what the Lord is saying uh, through his word. And um, we've had a, a, s some wonderful points that were made to us last Sunday right here from this pulpit. And I really appreciate the way the Lord in, in our study of the book of Numbers together gave us some insight last Sunday about what it means to walk with him in the desert, in the wilderness. And uh, the children of Israel did that, and many times we are doing that. Some of you may feel like you're in a desert, a wilderness time in your life right now. And there are some dangers. It's a time of lack. It's a time of want. It's a time where we are tempted to test the Lord and to grumble and complain. And, and that's a very serious sin before the Lord, and we can't allow ourselves to slip into that. There's also great opportunity in times of dryness and times of wilderness. And the Lord was reminding us that uh, his, we, can, we can rise up and, 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 and hold on to the promises, encourage ourselves and others. The Lord, it's a good land the Lord has given to us and we can, we can surely go up and take it because the Lord is with us. The spirit of Caleb, uh, the son of Jephunneh, who, 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 who sought the Lord fully and gave his heart fully to seeking the Lord. And that can be our experience in the wilderness too as we prepare for the promised land. So great stuff the Lord has, has shared with us already and from this pulpit last Sunday. And, and uh, thanks for speaking those words to us, Lord. But we're now finished in our corporate reading with the book of Numbers. So if you still haven't finished Numbers, you have time to catch up, but we have begun reading in the book of Psalms. And uh, we started uh, with uh, Psalm 73 and uh, we are up to I guess uh, Psalm 79, 80, something like that today, 81. Um, but I'm going to be sharing with you from Psalm 83. Uh, excuse me, Psalm 82, Psalm 82. So if you have one of these things, this magnificent collection of 66 books with you, I invite you to grab it now and open up with me to uh, Psalm 82. Psalm 82, we're going to be looking into God's word together. And it's a, it's a short psalm, but that doesn't necessarily mean this is going to be a short message. So uh, Psalm, Psalm 82. One of the most important themes that runs through the book of Psalms is a, is a theme that's emphasized here in Psalm 82, and we're going to see it. And it's the theme of justice. Justice. There's a powerful verse in Isaiah. I'm going to mention a couple of things before we, we start with Psalm 82, but there's a powerful verse in Isaiah. It's Isaiah 30, verse 18, where the prophet says this, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He waits on high to have compassion on you. Sometimes we labor under the misimpression that God is reluctant to bless us, that he doesn't really want, he's a little bit stingy, he doesn't want to give us good stuff. The contrary is true. He longs to be gracious to you. He waits on high to have compassion on us. And then the Isaiah goes on in Isaiah 30, 18, and he says, for our God is a God of justice. A God of justice. How blessed 
are those who long for him. And in just this brief verse, Isaiah 30, 18, there are two important uh, characteristics of God, two traits of his that so sometimes are held in tension and we need to understand them both if we want to understand the Lord. God, in the first part of the verse, mentions his grace and his compassion, what we saw often referred to as God's mercy, the mercy of God. The second part of the verse, it's his justice. God is a God of mercy. He's a God of justice. I think that usually believers in our conception of God, we tend to emphasize the mercy part. Often I hear Christians praying, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. That's a good prayer, we ought to pray it more. Not quite so often do I hear Christians praying, Lord have justice. If we ask God to have mercy, we should also ask him to have justice because those two things are equally parts of his character. And, and we're gonna see that really clearly uh, in Psalm 82, God's justice, God's mercy. There's, a, there's another, another verse in the Psalms, it's Psalm 89 verse 12, I think, where it says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne, O Lord, Psalm 89. Righteousness, the very throne of God rests upon the foundations of righteousness and justice. These two words, righteousness and justice, are really uh, two sides to the same coin. They both express the holiness of God. And righteousness, of course, is God's holiness expressed in the, in the character, in the life of an individual. Justice is God's holiness expressed in relationships with other people, in society, God's justice in our dealings with other people. When we hold justice and righteousness in addition to mercy in our understanding of the character of God and his throne, it helps us also in our dealings, our view of the universe that he's made, our understanding of our dealings with the men and women that he's called us to share this earth with. It's, it's, it's essential that we understand these things and, and focus on all of them, not just God's mercy, but also his justice, not just his righteousness personally in my own life, but looking beyond my own life, God's justice, his holiness is expressed in the world. And uh, that's what uh, Psalm 82 is about. So um, let's, let's read this powerful Psalm together. The scriptures remind us of, oh, just wanted to mention one other thing that in terms of, the, of, of thinking of what justice is, there's a very simple sort of seat of the pants definition for justice that, that occurred to me. And, and justice is simply this, people get what they deserve. The righteous are rewarded, the wicked are punished. Very simply, that's what justice is. And uh, that's what, we, that's what we, we will see uh, in this psalm. There's also um, two sides to, the, to justice. There is distributive justice and retributive justice. Just as a bird needs two wings to fly, um, distributive justice and retributive justice are both uh, vitally important in our understanding of God's, God's justice. The righteous are rewarded, the wicked are punished. And God's and just, justice has, has also an eternal characteristic, an eternal quality, but also it's expressed in time. And, and for some reason in God's sovereignty and his wisdom, his economy, he allots to men and women a limited ability to, to administer justice on the earth. And, and that's what Psalm 82 is about. There is a, a temporal justice. There's also an eternal justice. And in our uh, eschatology classes, which, which have concluded now, um, we were talking about, uh, we spent I think almost two entire sessions talking about the final judgment. This is God's ultimate justice. And Jesus spoke about this in terms of a parable in Matthew 25, verse 31 and, and following. And in, in that parable, he, he divides the son of, he the son of man divides justice into two, um, he divides humankind into two groups. There are the sheep and there are the goats. 
And he says to the sheep, come and inherit the kingdom prepared before the foundation of the world by my father. And to the goats, he says, depart into eternal punishment, eternal justice. So um, we, we will see both also uh, in Psalm uh, 82. Key here uh, in Matthew 25 is the fact that it is the Lord Jesus who is the judge. Interestingly, in John chapter 5, Jesus says, um, God himself does not judge anyone. He has committed all justice to the Son. And um, the Apostle Peter emphasizes this and, and repeats this fact in the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, verse 42. Acts 10, 42, um, he says in the house of Cornelius, God has appointed a day when he will judge the living and the dead through one man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the judge, the righteous judge, the eternal judge, but who also uh, has ordained justice uh, here on the earth and mankind to administer that, at least in a limited degree. One other really important verse in my mind that I think of a lot in terms of justice is in Proverbs, and it's Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15. Some of these I hope you'll remember and maybe look up or follow along with me. But um, in Proverbs 7, 15, um, this, is, this is what Solomon says. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are like an abomination to the Lord. Two things that are abominable to our God, justifying the wicked allowing people not to be punished and, and to receive the justice they, they deserve, and condemning the righteous. Here again, the, the retributive justice, distributive justice, two things that make the Lord sick and that he will not ultimately tolerate those who uh, condemn the righteous, those who justify the wicked. Eternal justice, temporal justice. Psalm 82, God takes his stand. God takes his stand in his own congregation. Are you with me? Psalm 82, verse 1. He judges in the midst of the rulers. And this is now God talking in verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. Then in verse 5, the Lord is talking about unjust judges and the rulers of his people. And this is what he says about them. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said to them, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. And then verse 8 is Asa speaking, the writer of the psalm. And he says this, Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is you who possesses all the nations. The plea of the psalmist, Arise, O God, judge the earth. You're the one who possesses all the nations. What do you hear in the tone of God's voice here in Psalm 82? What do you sense about what is in his heart? To me, the thing that really jumps out is, is the passion of our God. I don't know if sometimes we get this, the idea that God, God is kind of a dispassionate uh, and he's just sitting on his throne, you know, with his chin in his hand and kind of watching what happens on the earth and uh, not, very, not very involved, not very riled up. That's not the way I see the Lord at all. The Lord is a God of passion and he is passionate for justice. What are you passionate about? You're passionate for a particular sports team? Are you passionate for a political position? Are you passionate for your hobby or for your investments or for some particular interest of yours? But what the Lord is passionate about is justice as it's expressed temporally and eternally in time and in eternity. Let me ask you a question. Where do you go to find the Lord? Where do you go to find God? Some people I think would, by the way, you can talk back to me if you want to. I, I like that. Uh, just so I know you're awake, but uh, you can answer any question that I ask out loud. But uh, a lot of people would answer that question 
and say, well, I like to go out into nature. You know, I like to go sit on a rocky coastline and watch the waves crashing against the shore, and that's where I go to find God. The Bible, it's a good answer too. A lot of, some people would say, well, to find God, I, I, I peer into the interior of my soul. You know, I look deep in my soul, and, and that's where I find God. Do you know, I think Asaph would say, where do you find God? In the midst of his congregation. Where is God? He's taking his stand. He's not sitting down, by the way. Do you notice the posture of God in Psalm 82? He's standing up, and he's standing in the midst of his congregation. I think the best place to find God is to go where his people are. That's where you'll find him. That's where he is in Psalm 82. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John has a series of overwhelmingly powerful visions of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very first one that he has in Revelation chapter 1, he sees him uh, astoundingly glorious with a, a golden sash across his chest and his eyes are like a flame of fire. And you know where he sees him? He sees him walking among the seven golden lampstands. In his hand are seven stars, which are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven golden lampstands are the seven churches. That's where Jesus is. He's in the middle of his churches. He's in the middle of, the, of his people. And he start, his very first address to the very first church in Revelation 2, to the church in Ephesus, he identifies himself that way. And he says, I'm the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. God is active and he's, he's involved and he's in the middle of where his people are. And this is the Lord Jesus. And from that position, he exerts authority and he exercises judgment and justice. He speaks many good things, gives many gifts to the seven churches, but he also gives them some hard words and some judgment and some justice. And that's what we see in Psalm 82 also. He takes his stand in the midst of the congregation. He judges, 82, one, in the midst of the rulers. And then he asks them this question, verse two. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? God is very blunt, very direct about this. He is judging the judges. We call the Lord the King of Kings. We call him the Lord of Lords. He is also the judge of the judges. And judgment begins, according to 1 Peter 4.15, with the household of God. He starts judging, as he is here in Psalm 82, with the household of God. He is the one who, he is the judge of the judges. I don't know if the, uh, the nine people who dress in long black robes and sit on the Supreme Court in our nation know. Some of them probably do. He is the judge of judges. He's standing behind them. I'd like to ask you to turn with me to another passage of scripture, uh, if you will, and it's Isaiah chapter 3. Please take a moment and turn with me to Isaiah 3. Not sure if the scriptures are going to be behind us today or not, but um, this is a, a key passage that lends, gives us, lends light on to Psalm 82 and starting with the verse 13. So Isaiah 3, 13. In the Bible that I'm holding, uh, this particular translation, uh, there is a, 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 a subtitle over this portion of scripture, Isaiah 3.13, and it says, God will judge. The Lord arises to contend and stands to judge the people. You see how this reflects Psalm 82. The Lord's arising, as Asaph asked him to do, he's standing to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. And this is what he says to them. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord. Do you sense the passion and the anger? I feel in the, in, in the uh, NLT version, this says, who do you think you are? Being unfair to the poor, grinding the face of the poor trampling on justice. God is taking this very seriously. 
So back to Psalm 82, verse 2. I love the way God's word confirms itself and repeats itself uh, throughout the scriptures. And uh, Isaiah 3, one example. He says this, How long will you, will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? This is how justice is perverted, how, it, how justice is abrogated when, the, when, when there's partiality shown to the wicked, when people are not treated equally. And he, he rebukes the elders of Israel for that. And he says, how long are you going to show partiality to the wicked? Partiality, favoritism, not treating people equally or fairly. Moses talks about this in, his, in, in, in light of his own role as a judge of the people of Israel in, in Deuteronomy chapter 1. This is another great passage to turn to uh, if you want to join me in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Uh, this is starting in verse 16, Deuteronomy 1.16. Deuteronomy 1.16, if you're with me, this is what Moses says. I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your fellow countrymen, and judge righteously between a man and his fellow countrymen, or the alien who is, who is with him. Verse 17, Deuteronomy 1.17, You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. Get it? Nobody gets special treatment. You shall not fear man, for the judgment is God's. It is the Lord who judges. No partiality, no favoritism. This is God's definition of judgment, of justice. Have you ever played tourist in Washington, D.C.? Have you, have you ever gone to the, our nation's capital? It's a wonderful city to go and to walk around, and it's, it's a beautiful city. I love to go to D.C. And um, when you're in D.C., you can... One of, the, one of the things I like the best about D.C. is that they have wonderful museums, and they're free. Uh, so go to, go to Washington, D.C. and play tourist sometime if you haven't done it recently. But while you're in Washington, D.C., you can visit each of the three seats of our government. You can go to the White House, the seat of the executive branch of our government. You can go to the um, <clears throat> Capitol building, the seat of the legislative branch of our government. And you can go to the Supreme Court, the seat of the judicial branch of our government. Wonderful places to go. And if you go to the Supreme Court uh, and, and, go, and stand in front of that amazing building, you'll see some broad steps laid out before you. And surmounting the steps, there are a series of huge pillars. And the pillars uphold the lintel of, over the Supreme Court. And in the cornice of the lintel over the Supreme Court, there is one phrase engraved deeply in the stone. It consists of five words. Does anybody know what's over the, over the banner, over the head of the top of the Supreme Court, what it says there? It says, equal justice under the law. Equal justice under the law. That's what our government strives for. Our nation has not always lived up to those principles. If you want some examples of that, talk to someone who is descended from the native peoples, uh, who uh, for centuries were, were killed and driven away from their homelands and persecuted treated without justice by our nation. If you want further evidence of that, uh, talk to someone who's descended from the tens of millions of enslaved Africans who were brought to our shores uh, in slave ships and uh, how they were treated. We haven't always lived up to equal justice under the law, but we still prize that phrase, and we should, and we shouldn't give up. That should be our goal to seek after that, equal justice under the law. Where did the founders get that phrase? Did they make it up out of their own heads? They got it from Deuteronomy chapter 1. They got it from Isaiah chapter 3. They got it from Psalm 82. Let me ask you another question. 
If you had to think of one particular writer of the New Testament who focuses heavily on the theme of justice, is there any particular person that comes to mind? Let's turn to the book of James chapter 2. Flip with me in your Bible, please, to James chapter 2. I got some people that are on the ball in this congregation. The title over um, this portion of scripture in the Bible that I'm holding, James chapter 2, is The Sin of Partiality. And this is what James says, My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. You see, partiality, favoritism. And then he goes on to give an example of how a wealthy man came into the congregation and was given special treatment in a place of special honor. And uh, then a poor man came in in dirty clothes and he was shunted off into the corner, told to stand by himself in a place of dishonor. This is what James says in verse 4, James chapter 2, verse 4. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Judges with evil motives. Strong language. God chose the poor of this world to be rich in faith. He goes on and he says, it's the rich who oppress you and drag you into the court. Verse 8. If you're fulfilling the royal law, the law, the law of scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Lord spoke to us about that earlier in the service. You're doing well. Verse 9, James 2, 9. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Partiality. Not a trivial sin. Let me ask you something else. Have you ever wondered why God allows so much injustice in the earth? Why do the righteous suffer? Why do the wicked prosper? If I was God, I would put an end to this right away and, uh, and stop all this injustice immediately. Why does God allow this? Why does he allow injustice to persist and to go on? This is a question that, that runs through the Psalms, and you know if you've read the Psalms that this is on the minds of, of many of the Psalmists. Why do the wicked prosper? Why do the righteous suffer? And I think that maybe part of the answer to the question lies in the difference between justice in time, temporal justice, and justice in eternity, God's eternal justice. In Psalm 94, which we won't turn to, but uh, Psalm 94, verses 6 and 7, the Lord talks about wicked men on the face of the earth. And he says that they, they kill the, uh, the stranger, they kill the widow, he says that they slay them, and that, that they murder the orphans. And it says they say in their hearts, the Lord doesn't see. The God of Jacob takes no notice. There are wicked men strutting about on the face of the earth today. Some of them are the leaders of countries and have destroyed the lives of tens of millions of people. And they're saying in their minds, God doesn't see. The Lord doesn't even take notice of me. Take notice of this. I could name names, but I won't. Some of these men are in for a rude awakening one day. I'm not going to find out. Yeah, I guess God noticed some of the wicked deeds that were done. If there's not justice in time, there will be justice in eternity before the final judgment. Well, what does the Lord expect of the judges and the rulers of Israel? Going back to Psalm 82, what commands, what instructions does he have for them? Let's look back at, at Psalm 82, it's going to be about verse 3. We've seen what justice isn't showing partiality. What is justice? 82.3. Vindicate the weak and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. These are strong verbs. These are things that God expects those who 
are entrusted to do justice to do, that to vindicate, to do justice, to rescue, to deliver. This is the distributive part of justice, God's care for the poor and the needy, God's love and compassion for the afflicted, for the widow, for the orphan. I love especially the second of his commands here, do justice to the afflicted and the, rest and the destitute. Justice is not just a noun, justice is a verb. Justice is something God commands us to do. This is reflected in Micah 6, 8, verse that some of you are familiar with, where, the, where he says, he has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. You see both sides again, God's justice, God's mercy, do justice, love mercy. This is what the Lord expects of the rulers of Israel, his distributive justice. Let me ask you something else. Do you desire the anointing of the Lord Jesus in your life? Is it possible for us to be anointed by the same Holy Spirit that he was and is and to allow his anointing to rest on us? How does Jesus himself describe his own anointing? In Isaiah 61, he mentions it, he repeats it in, in uh, Matthew and Luke chapter four. He says this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty the captives, to set free those who are downtrodden and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. The very first thing he describes in his anointing, the Lord Jesus's, is that he's, he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. There's a special place in the heart of God for the poor. Does that mean that, that the middle class people and rich people don't get to hear the gospel? Of course not. But there is a, but when he starts with the poor, and I think that's, that's highly significant. My own experience, I mean, even out here on Friday evenings, is that it's a lot easier to preach the gospel to the poor people. You know, if, if I approach someone who's, who's doing well and who's well off and share Jesus, try to share Jesus with them, they're, they're, they're apt to, if they, they either wave you off or else they're apt to say, you know, if they, if they take the mo a moment to listen, they're apt to say, well, I'm really glad Jesus works for you, but I, I don't need him in my life. I mean, I'm doing very fine just the way I am. Thank you very much. I don't need Jesus. The poor suffer under no such delusion. They know their need. They know that they need the Lord. They know that their lives are, are a wreck, as all of ours are outside of Christ. And so Jesus is anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Another part of his anointing is in Isaiah chapter 11. And I'd like to ask you to turn there with me also, if you will. Another passage in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 11. And some of you will, will know that this is the passage about Jesus as the branch, the branch from the, from the stem of Jesse, Isaiah chapter 11. A branch from Jesse's roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. This is the Lord Jesus. Wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will, not, he will, not, he will delight in the fear of the Lord and he will not judge by what his eyes see nor make a decision by what his ears hear. Verse four of Isaiah 11. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. You see here again, distributive and retributive justice. Jesus is gonna strike the earth. He's gonna slay the wicked with the breath of his mouth. But the, the poor, he's gonna judge and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. That's the anointing of the Lord Jesus and he wants us to, to share in that also. Jesus, the Lord addresses the unrighteous judges and rulers of his people in around verse um, six and seven, going back to uh, Psalm 82 again. So let's flip back to Psalm 82.
he talks about a particular group of people and he addresses them with the, with the pronoun they. And so when you're reading through this psalm, you have to stop Psalm 82, verse 6, I think it is. Um, and say, who, oh no, it's in verse 5, and say, who are the they? The they, I believe, uh, are the, 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 the rulers of his people, the elders, who are not judging righteously, not exercising justice, not doing justice. And this is what he says about them, 82.5. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said to them, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. What does he mean when he says to them, you're gods? You will be, you're, what, he's, what he is saying is not, and, and by the way, Jesus quotes this uh, in John chapter 10, verse 34. I said to them, you are gods. It doesn't mean that they're deities. It means that uh, they have a, a measure of authority as the sons of God to exercise justice and uh, judgment in a limited way on the earth. And yet they can't be uppity about it. He says, he says this about them, they're ignorant. They walk in darkness. They have no foundation. God is very blunt about this. And he says they're gonna die like men because of the injustice that they've perpetrated. The judges will be judged. The Apostle Paul brings a smack up against a very startling fact that sometimes we're, is, makes us very uncomfortable and it's in 2 Corinthians 5. 10. Some of you know 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds that we have done in the body, whether good or ill. That's where we're all going to appear one day. We will be judged before the judgment seat of Christ. Remember Matthew chapter 25 as he separates the sheep from the goats. So Asa, Asaph concludes in verse 8, and he says, Lord, would you arise and judge the nations? Jesus is the judge. Now, in Luke chapter 18, there's a, a parable that's quite familiar to most of us, and um, it has to do with um, a widow going to a judge and trying to get legal protection from her opponent. And... Um, it starts out but with, with Luke saying that Jesus told them this parable to, to show them that they ought always to pray and not to faint or not to lose heart or grow weary. And uh, then it tells the story, as, as many of you remember, of the, the woman who went to the unrighteous judge and he, he kind of ignored her for a while, but she pestered him so much. They finally said, all right, all right, I'll give you what you want. And uh, I think if, if you ask most of us, what's the theme of the parable of the widow and the judge in Isaiah, excuse me, in uh, Luke 18, uh, we would probably say persistence in prayer, right? That's what Luke says. Jesus taught them this parable so that they would, they would pray always and not faint, pray at all times and not faint. I think the secondary theme is persistence in prayer. The primary theme of this parable is justice. What is it that the widow was going to the judge for? She wanted justice. How does Jesus sum up uh, this parable and the meaning of it? He says, will not God bring about justice for his elect to who cry out to him day and night? I tell you, he will bring them justice and he'll do it quickly. God is a God who brings justice to his elect and he wants us. He wants them to cry out to him day and night. There's only one person in the universe who is fully just. Only one person in the universe who is fully merciful. He will command justice in eternity on the day of the final judgment. It will begin. And he, will, he expects justice on the earth and those to whom he has entrusted authority. And that includes us. Do, I don't know if you see yourself um, as someone who has been allotted authority by the Lord, but you are. The Lord has given people to you that look to you, people that you can bless, people that you can encourage, people that you can speak the truth in love 
to. Each of us has, a, has its own, his own sphere, her own sphere of authority. And the Lord is going to hold us accountable for um, how we dealt with those who are under our charge. It's an important thing, and it's a, it's a blessing, but it's also a responsibility and something that we are one day going to give an account for. The Lord owns the nations. That's what Asaph concludes. The Lord commits, the God, God the Father commits judge, judgment and justice to the Son. Psalm, eight, Psalm 2 talks about this. We've been reading Psalm 82, verse 8. In Psalm 2, verse 8, Jesus says that the Lord said to him, Ask of me, and I will give the very nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. Jesus, the one who has ultimate justice, the ultimate judge, the judge of judges. I'm glad I'm not the judge. Aren't you? Not that I'm not, but that you're not. <laughs> but neither of us are. However, this does not let us off the hook. This does not mean that we need to be unconcerned about injustice and promoting justice and doing justice. It's really easy to observe injustice in the world and just shrug your shoulders and say, ah, what can one person do? After all, que sera, sera. I see bad things happening, but you know, I'm just one person. What can one person do? Down through the ages, Christian men and women of faith and courage have not just shrugged their shoulders. I'm thinking of a, a young member of parliament by the name of William Wilberforce who saw incredible injustice, slavery throughout the British Empire. He didn't just say, oh, well, what can, what can one man do? He campaigned and lobbied and worked for years and changed the course of parliament and the very course of, of sla and ended slavery in the British Empire. There is something one person can do. On our side of the Atlantic, I'm thinking of another committed Christian man who is a minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and he saw tremendous injustice being done to the group of people of which, of which he was a part. And Frederick Douglass didn't sit back and say, oh, I can't do much, I'm just one person. He lobbied, he worked, he gathered steam for the abolitionist movement, and he said, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a difference. I'm gonna take a stand for justice. Do justice. That's what God said to Micah. That's what he said in Psalm 2, even to unjust rulers. He said, do justice. It's not something that we just believe in. We don't just engrave it in stone and say, well, now that we have the motto, we're okay. It's something the Lord will hold us account to. And Asa takes his stand where we should take our stand in verse 8. Let's look at verse 8 again, the concluding verse of Psalm 82. Arise, O God, judge the earth. For it is you who possesses all the nations. Arise, O God. I believe the Lord wants us to cry out to him to arise. Arise, O God. Just to give one, one of, of hundreds of examples that we could give. For generations now, almost a generation, our brothers and sisters in northern Nigeria have been persecuted and murdered and robbed and, and, and maltreated by jihadists, brothers and sisters of ours. Their, their churches and homes have been destroyed and burned. Uh, their people have been carried off into captivity. The government of Nigeria shrugs their shoulders, says, well, we really can't do that much. God, arise. We ought to cry out to him day and night for justice for our brothers uh, and sisters in northern Nigeria, just to name one, pla <clears throat> one place among many. Lord, arise. The Lord wants you and me to cry out for justice. One other psalm I'd like to ask you to turn with me to, and it's Psalm uh, 96. We're going to be in the psalms for a while, so I'm giving you a little bit of a previews of coming attractions. A couple of weeks from now, we'll be in Psalm 96. <coughs> Excuse me. And... Toward the, let's see, Psalm 96, verse 10. If you can turn just to Tom, this is a powerful psalm. Um, but in Psalm 96, verse 10, 
This is what the psalmist says. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that it contains. Let the field exult and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord. There is a joy embedded in every part of God's creation. You can hear it if you listen to it. It's connected, ultimately, the expression of this is what Paul talks about in Romans 8, the revealing of the glory of the sons of God. And uh, the earth has been subjected to futility, not of its own will, but the will of him who subjected it. All that is gonna end one day. Even now, the seas roaring, the fields exulting, the forests. A couple of weeks ago, I was hiking in my beloved Adirondacks in the woods and uh, spending time among these huge trees. And uh, I, uh, I listened to the trees and I didn't hear them singing aloud for joy. In fact, even if I put my ear up to the trunk of a tree, I couldn't even hear them, you know, humming melodies to themselves. They were pretty quiet, but they're not always going to be quiet. There's going to be a day when the trees of the forest are going to sing for joy and the sea's going to roar and everything and the field is going to rejoice. Why? Before the Lord, verse 13. Why? Because he is coming. He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. That's our hope, brothers and sisters. That's our hope. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for what you've been saying to us and blessing us and speaking to us through each other. Thank you, Lord, especially for the reminders as we've been reading in the book of Numbers. And Lord, for reminding us last week that, Lord, even though we are in the wilderness and in the desert with the children of Israel and some of our lives, Lord, that um, during the, a time of dryness and a time of lack, Lord, we can not give in to grumbling and complaining, but the Lord, that we can um, turn to you, take the opportunities that you give us, remind ourselves and others that it's a good land, that you're bringing us to a land full of milk, with flowing with milk and honey, and we can surely go up. Lord, give us the spirit of, of uh, Caleb, Lord, to follow you fully. And Lord, I just wanna thank you for being a God of justice, for being a God of mercy. Lord, we do cry out to you, Lord, have mercy. And we also cry out to you, Lord, have justice.